The Temple of Solomon was built in the mid-10th century BC, beginning in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel. The purpose of the temple was to house the Ark of the Covenant, which the Lord commanded Moses to construct when the children of Israel were in the wilderness. There Moses placed within it the Ten Commandments, Aaron's rod, and a vessel of manna. Before the temple was built, the Ark was kept in a tent-like abode called the Tabernacle. Solomon was a wise man. His wisdom, in fact, was granted to him by God. For in a dream, when the king was young, the Lord told Solomon that he would grant him anything he wished. After a little contemplation, Solomon asked the Lord for wisdom. God was so pleased with Solomon's decision that the Lord not only granted the king wisdom, but also great wealth. Solomon would go on to use this wealth to glorify the Lord who granted him such an abundance. The temple was built with stones that were not only quarried off-site, but were also shapen far from the temple's location, so that, as the Bible states, there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. Speaking on the temple, St. John Chrysostom had this to say, quote, Nowhere else in the world was such a temple constructed as this, either for costliness or beauty or anything else. For God, who ordained it, commanded that it should be made with great magnificence, for it had bricks of gold in the walls, and anyone who wishes may learn this in the book of Kings, 1 Kings chapter 10, 14 to be exact, how many talents of gold were then expended. Solomon covered the interior of the temple with beams and boards of cedar. There was no stone seen. The inner walls were carved with figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers, and the whole house was overlaid in gold. The Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant was placed, measured to be about 33 feet in length, in breadth, and in height, and was overlaid with pure gold. For the construction of the two brass pillars that would stand on each side of the porch of the temple, Solomon sent for Hiram out of Tyre, which is in modern-day Lebanon. The Bible states that Hiram was a widow's son of the tribe of Naphtali, a worker in brass and filled with wisdom and understanding. He came to Solomon and wrought all his work. 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 14. So Hiram forged the two brass pillars. He named the right pillar Jachin and named the left pillar Boaz. In addition to the brass pillars, Hiram also forged what the Bible calls the Molten Sea, which was a brass basin for water, but on a grand scale. It was over 15 feet in diameter and over 8 feet in height. It stood upon 12 brass oxen, three looking north, three looking west, three looking south, and three looking east. It was over 6 inches thick and had a brim similar to that of a cup. After the temple was completed, the elders came with the priests and took up the ark. The priests came to the temple and placed the ark in the Holy of Holies. When the priests came out of the temple, behold, a cloud filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon blessed all the congregation of Israel. Solomon made a great prayer unto God, and the king and all of Israel with him offered sacrifice before the Lord. Thus the temple was completed and dedicated, and there the Spirit of the Lord God did dwell. This is the leap of faith. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem with a very great company, and camels that bear spices, and gold in abundance, and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him all that was in her heart. Thus begins the story of the Queen of Sheba found in the pages of the Holy Bible. Scripture does not mention much more of the queen other than what has been stated above. However, there is an extra-biblical account of the story of the Queen of Sheba that goes into much detail. That book is known to the Ethiopians as the Kebernagast, which is interpreted as the glory of kings. The Christians of Ethiopia hold this book sacred and base their lineage from the union of Solomon and Sheba as found in its pages. Though the Ethiopian Orthodox Church holds the story as part of her history, many are skeptical as to its authenticity. One Ethiopian scholar has stated that he would not say that the story is false or that the story is true, but believes that we should all enjoy this rich culture that has come down to us through the traditions found in the Bible, in history, and in legend. So, let us now embark on a journey back to the ancient past, to antiquity, and discover great secrets as we slowly unravel the mysteries found in these wonderful stories. It is believed that the Queen of Sheba, Makeda being her name, lived in the 10th century BC and was from the country of Ethiopia or possibly Yemen. Some sources would point to her ruling both countries, since they are close geographically and also due to archaeological discoveries in the Yemen that suggest a royal presence in the region dating back to ancient times. The queen is mentioned in both the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. In the Old Testament, her story is found in 1 Kings chapter 10 and 2 Chronicles chapter 9. 
In the New Testament, Christ himself refers to her as the Queen of the South in Matthew chapter 12, verse 42, and again in Luke chapter 11, verse 31. In the 27th chapter of the Quran, a history of Solomon is given and speaks of the land of Saba that is ruled by a woman, most likely the Queen of Sheba. Going further, chapter 34 of the Quran is called al Saba, a reference to Yemen, where the queen may have also reigned. Finally, the most detailed account of the Queen of Sheba is found in the Ethiopian holy book, the Kebernagost. Though the Kebernagost gives an account of the events from antiquity, it was written over 2,000 years later in the 14th century AD. From the text of the Kebernagost, Queen Makita went to visit King Solomon in order to test his wisdom and to see for herself the riches and magnificence of his kingdom. She came with many gifts for Solomon, along with a great company of camels and servants. When the queen finally arrived in Jerusalem, she was dumbstruck by the wisdom of Solomon. After spending much time in ancient Israel and conversing with the king, Queen Makeda not only knew for herself that the reports about Solomon were true, but was convinced that he was even wiser than what she had been told. Now Solomon was a lover of women, and he desired the queen. However, she was a virgin, and it was not her intention to give herself to him. So Solomon devised a plan. On the last night of the queen's visit, King Solomon told her that he would not take anything from her if she would not take anything from him. The queen laughed that Solomon and all his riches would say such a thing and so promised him. When the evening meal was brought, Solomon instructed his servants to give Makita food seasoned with pepper and to lace her drink with vinegar in order to make her thirsty. After dinner, the king went to sleep on one side of his chamber and the queen on the other side, but before they went to sleep, the king had a bowl of water placed between them. That night, the queen awoke with a great thirst due to the spice and vinegar that the king had secretly put in her food. So she looked at the bowl of water and desired so much to quench her thirst. Looking at Solomon, she thought he was asleep. However, he was only pretending and was watching her closely. As the queen raised the bowl to take a drink, the king took hold of her hand and said, Since you have broken your oath, now I am relieved of my oath. The queen protested and argued that it was just water. The king replied, saying, What on earth is more precious than water? So the queen said, Be free from your oath, but let me drink water. So Solomon permitted her to drink water, and after the queen had drunk the water, he worked his will with her, and they slept together. Thus is the legend of Solomon and Sheba. It is more than possible that several liberties were taken in its creation. However, it is an interesting piece of ancient literature that deserves to be studied, if not for historical or biblical research, then most definitely for its cultural development. What has been left out of this study of the Kebernagost is the tale of the son that would be born from the relationship between Solomon and Sheba and how the worship of the one true God will be brought back to Ethiopia on the queen's return from Jerusalem. But that is another story. This is the Leap of Faith. In 922 BC, Rehoboam, King Solomon's son and successor, attempted to carry out some oppressive policies. This led to the secession of northern Israel. Jeroboam, the spokesman of the northern tribes, was encouraged to lead a revolt. When Rehoboam refused to halt taxes and forced labor, the northern Israelites split from Judah and chose Jeroboam I as their king. The kingdoms of Israel and Judah continued with a separate but interrelated existence for about 200 years until the fall of Samaria in 722 BC by the Assyrians. This era of division was mixed with peaceful as well as trying times for both Israel and Judah. For example, once Rehoboam secured the kingdom of Judah, he forsook the law of the Lord, as did the people. As a result of this apostasy, the Lord allowed Shishak, king of Egypt, to come against Jerusalem and take away the treasures out of the house of the Lord. Judah and Israel would also struggle against one another. Abijah, the son of Rehoboam, went to war with Jeroboam. Now under his leadership, Abijah and the people of Judah served the Lord and cried unto him. When Jeroboam battled against Abijah, God smote Jeroboam and all of Israel. The children of Israel fled before Judah, and God delivered them into their hand. The son of Abijah, who ruled after him, was Azza. Azza reigned in Jerusalem for forty years and did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He drove out the Sodomites and removed the idols. He also brought in things dedicated into the house of the Lord, silver and gold and vessels. So there was peace in the kingdom during this period. Towards the end of Azza's rule over Judah, Ahab became king of Israel. Now Ahab did evil in the sight of the Lord. He married the Phoenician princess Jezebel and served the god Baal and worshipped him. Jezebel slew many of the prophets of the Lord. But the prophet Elijah was protected, as were other prophets. God sent Elijah to Ahab, and with boldness Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal who ate at Jezebel's table. 
Elijah made the 450 prophets of Baal place a slaughtered bull on their altar of sacrifice, and Elijah would place a slaughtered bull on the altar of the Lord. Elijah proclaimed to the servants of Baal, Call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. The prophets of Baal called on their God from morning till noon, but there was no answer. Elijah began to mock them, and they started to cut themselves with knives till blood gushed from their wounds. They continued to cry until evening, but there was no answer from the gods they worshipped. Then came Elijah and poured four barrels of water upon the altar of the Lord. He did this three times and called upon the God of Israel. Then fire from the Lord fell and consumed the sacrifice and licked up all the water. The people seeing this gave glory to God, and Elijah slew all the prophets of Baal at the book Kishon. Time went on, and again the northern kingdom fell into idolatry. During the reign of Jeroboam II, in the mid-8th century BC, the people also became materialistic and oppressed the poor. To bring Israel out of this debauchery, God sent Amos to prophesy. Amos rebuked the king and his pagan priests for their idolatry. He preached to the people to turn away from idol worship and to worship the one and living God. Unfortunately, the king, priests, and people would not hearken to the prophet's teachings. Amos then prophesied, saying, Thy wife shall be a harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be measured with the line, and thou shalt die in an unclean land, and Israel shall be left captive out of the land. Amos 7.17 This prophecy would soon be fulfilled, for in 722 B.C. the Assyrians invaded Israel. Samaria fell, Israel was destroyed, and the ten northern tribes were led away captive, never to return. Thus derives the saying, The Ten Lost Tribes of Israel. This is the Leap of Faith. After the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, the Assyrians who conquered them would also fall the century following. After the death of the Assyrian ruler Ashurbanipal in 627 BC, the Assyrian Empire began to crumble due to civil war. Taking advantage of this weakness, the Babylonians attacked an alliance with the Medes, Persians, Scythians, and Kermerians. Nineveh was sacked in 612 BC, and the seat of power in the region was transferred to Babylonia. Thus began a period of Mesopotamian history that witnessed a significant improvement in daily life. Agricultural projects flourished, as did other arts and sciences. This new power would be known as the Neo-Babylonian Empire. The most significant ruler of the Neo-Babylonian Empire was King Nebuchadnezzar. He would go on to capture much territory for his empire, as well as beautifying his kingdom with impressive construction projects. For example, in 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar led an army against the Egyptian ruler Necho II, who was occupying Syria. This would go down in history as the Battle of Charchemish, where Pharaoh Necho II was defeated and Syria and Phoenicia were brought under the control of Babylon. In the field of art and architecture, Nebuchadnezzar enlarged the royal palace, built a bridge over the Euphrates, and constructed the processional way and the famous Ishtar Gate, lavishly decorated with glazed brick. In addition to these military excursions and engineering endeavors, King Nebuchadnezzar also made biblical history through his sieges of Jerusalem and by destroying the Temple of Solomon. According to the Bible, in 598 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and his army came against Judah and besieged it. King Jehoiakim died during the siege, and in the following year, 597, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem and took the new king Jeconiah prisoner. He then installed King Zedekiah and took from him a rich tribute. Along with Jeconiah, prominent citizens and craftsmen, and much of the Jewish population, numbering about 10,000, were deported back to Babylon. As devastating as this was for Judah, the Babylonians would return a decade later. Though Nebuchadnezzar installed Zedekiah, he revolted against Babylon and entered into an alliance with Pharaoh Hophra, king of Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar responded by once again invading Judah and began the second siege of Jerusalem in 589 BC. The siege lasted until famine prevailed and the city was broken up. The men of war fled by night and the king went the way toward the plain. However, the Babylonians pursued after the king and captured him in the plains of Jericho, where his army deserted him. Zedekiah was then taken to the king of Babylon for judgment in Riblah. There they killed Zedekiah's sons in front of him, and then put out his eyes and carried him off to Babylon, where he remained a prisoner until he died. The final blow came on the 9th of Av in 586 BC. Nebuzaradan, captain of the guard, a servant of King Nebuchadnezzar, came into Jerusalem. 
He burnt the temple and the king's house and all the houses of Jerusalem. The walls of Jerusalem were broken down round about. The people in the city were carried away, but the poor were left behind to be vine dressers. The pillars of brass that were in the temple, as well as the brass sea, were broken in pieces and taken away. All the vessels of gold and silver were also plundered and taken back to Babylon. The temple was completely destroyed, and all of Jerusalem with it. King Nebuchadnezzar returned to Babylon with the treasures of the temple and a great number of the people of Judah. This would be the final deportation in the period of Jewish history known as the Babylonian Captivity. This is the Leap of Faith. Cyrus the Great, also known as Cyrus the Elder by the Greeks, was the founder of the Achaemenid Empire, the first of the Persian empires. Under his rule, all the previous civilized states of the ancient Near East were conquered. Cyrus's empire was also expanded to most of Southwest Asia and much of Central Asia and the Caucasus. But the most significant victory for Cyrus came in 539 BC when the Persian army marched on Babylon. Babylon was thought to be impregnable. The city, which was built on both sides of the Euphrates River, had enormous fortified double walls and enclosed an area of some 200 square miles. The outside wall was protected by a wide, deep moat fed by the Euphrates River. Five brass gates connecting streets to the outside were protected by drawbridges, which were raised at night. Spanning the north end of the river, between the east and west bank wall, were two huge levied gates of brass. At night the gates were swung shut and secured by large iron bars. In those days of ancient warfare, the city was impregnable. However, the ancient Greek historian Herodotus states that Cyrus diverted the Euphrates into a new channel, and guided by two deserters, marched by the dry bed into the city while the Babylonians were carousing at a feast of their gods. According to the Bible, King Belshazzar of Babylon made a great feast one night. While he was drinking wine, he commanded that the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, be used for him and his princes, his wives and his concubines, that they might drink therein. Then, as they drank wine and praised the gods of silver and gold, came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote on the wall of the king's palace. The king was suddenly troubled, so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees knocked. The king's wise men were brought in, but they could not interpret the writing. Then was the prophet Daniel brought in. He was able to read the writing on the wall and give the interpretation. And this is the writing that was written. Many, many, tekel ufarsin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and are found wanting. Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Thus the Persian army marched into the city on a dry riverbed and took Babylon without a fight. And just as the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar had been instrumental in enslaving the Jews and leading them into captivity, so was King Cyrus of Persia instrumental in freeing the Jewish refugees and encouraged them to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. In the book of Ezra it states, Now in the first year of Cyrus king of Persia, the Lord upstirred up the spirit of Cyrus, that he made a proclamation, saying, Thus saith Cyrus king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Cyrus went on to bring forth the vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, and sent them back to Jerusalem along with the Jewish refugees. Thus a new era in Jewish history was born, known as the Second Temple Period. This is the Leap of Faith. After Alexander the Great had defeated the Persians and conquered many lands and advanced to the ends of the earth, he fell sick and perceived that he was dying. So he summoned his most honored generals and divided his kingdom among them. Soon Alexander was dead, and his officers began to rule, each in his own place, and they set up kingdoms for themselves. One such kingdom that sprang from the division of Alexander's Macedonian Empire was the Seleucid Empire, founded by Seleucus I Nicantor. Seleucus' kingdom covered much of the territory of the ancient Near East, a dynasty which existed from 312 B.C. to 63 B.C. The Seleucids held a light rule over the territory of Judea and the Jewish people. They respected Jewish culture and protected Jewish institutions. However, during the reign of Antiochus IV Epiphanes, beginning in 175 B.C., 
the Jews were faced with harsh persecutions which led to a rebellion against his rule. This Jewish uprising against Greek influence will be known as the Maccabean Revolt and lasted from 167 to 160 BC. After taking control of Egypt, Antiochus went up against Israel and came to Jerusalem with a strong force. He arrogantly entered the sanctuary and took the golden altar and the table of showbread. He stripped off the golden ornaments from the temple as well as other costly vessels and the hidden treasure that he found. He took them all and went into his own land after shedding much blood. Two years later, in 168 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes returned to Jerusalem and captured the city. Then the king wrote to his whole kingdom that all should be one people and that all should give up their particular customs. Many from Israel gladly adopted his religion. They sacrificed to idols and profaned the Sabbath. Antiochus erected the abomination of desolation on the altar of burnt offering, and on the 25th day of Chislev they offered sacrifice upon the idolatrous altar, which was upon the altar of God, and this sacrifice is believed to have been a pig. But many in Israel stood firm and resolved not to eat unclean food and chose rather to die than to profane the holy covenant, and they did die, and very great wrath came upon Israel. In those days, Adathias, a priest from the family of Jorab, moved from Jerusalem and settled in Modin. He had five sons, namely Judas called Maccabeus, meaning the hammer. Mattathias saw the blasphemies being committed in Judah and Jerusalem, and he and his sons tore their clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourned greatly. The king's officers who were enforcing the apostasy came to Modin to make them offer sacrifice. Mattathias strongly refused and said loudly, We will not obey the king's words by turning aside from our religion to the right hand or to the left. And just as he finished speaking, a Jew came forward to sacrifice on the altar of Modin, according to the order of the king. Seeing it, Mattathias, filled with zeal and righteous anger, ran and killed him on the altar. He also killed the king's officer who was enforcing the sacrifice and tore down the altar. Then he and his sons fled to the hills. Then there united with them a company of Hasidians, mighty warriors of Israel, and other fugitives joined them and reinforced them. They organized an army and struck down sinners in their anger. Mattathias and his friends tore down the altars, forcibly circumcised all the uncircumcised boys within the borders of Israel, and rescued the law out of the hands of the Gentiles and kings, and they never let the sinner gain the upper hand. Now the days drew near for Mattathias to die, and he instructed his sons to show zeal for the law and to give their lives for the covenant of their ancestors. Then his son Judas Maccabeus took command in his place. All his brothers and the others who joined his father helped him, and they gladly fought for Israel. Judas extended the glory of his people. Like a giant he put on his breastplate. He bound on his armor of war and waged battles, protecting the camp with his sword. When King Antiochus heard these reports, he was greatly angered. He gathered and sent all the forces of his kingdom and opened his coffers and paid his troops until all the money in the treasury was exhausted. Troubled by this financial loss, Antiochus went to Persia in the hopes of collecting the revenues from that region. However, the king had to retreat from Persia, for the people fought him as he attempted to rob the temples of Persepolis. In a rage, he returned to Jerusalem with arrogant intent as he spoke of making Jerusalem a cemetery for Jews. But the God of Israel struck him with an incurable and invisible blow. The ungodly man's body swarmed with worms, and as he suffered in agony, his flesh rotted away. Before he died, he uttered these words, It is right to be subject to God. Mortals should not think that they are equal to God. So the murderer and blasphemer came to the end of his life by a most pitiable fate among the mountains in a strange land. Now Judas Maccabeus and his followers recovered the temple in the city. They purified the sanctuary and tore down the altar of burnt offering which had been profaned. They decided to store the stones in a convenient place until a prophet should come and tell them what to do with them. Then they took unhewn stones as the law directs and built a new altar like the former one. They also rebuilt the sanctuary in the interior of the temple and consecrated the courts. Then, early in the morning on the 25th day of Chislev in 164 BC, they rose and offered sacrifice on the new altar of burnt offering that they had built. At that very season, on the very day that the Greeks had profaned it, it was dedicated with song and harps and lutes and cymbals. All the people fell on their faces and worshipped and blessed the God of heaven who had prospered them. So they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days and joyfully offered burnt offerings. Then Judas and all the assembly of Israel determined that each year at that season, the day of dedication of the altar should be observed with joy and gladness for eight days, beginning with the 25th day of the month of Chislev. According to rabbinic tradition, the Maccabees could only find one jar of oil that had remained unpolluted by virtue of a seal, and although it only contained enough oil to light the menorah for one day, it miraculously lasted for eight days. Thus was birthed 
the Jewish festival of Hanukkah. This is the leap of faith. Jerusalem was sacked and destroyed by the Romans under the command of Titus in 70 AD. The evangelists Matthew, Mark, and Luke cite the prophecies concerning the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple, the desolation of Judea, and the evils that would befall the Jewish nation. The Jewish historian Josephus writes, Caesar ordered that they should now demolish the entire city and temple, but for all the rest of the wall it was so thoroughly razed to the ground by those that dug it up to the foundation that there was nothing left to make those that came thither believe it had ever been inhabited. Thus the prophecy of Christ uttered in Matthew 24 verse 22 that there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down was fulfilled. Many are of the school that the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD was the recompense of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ some 40 years earlier by the Romans via the Jewish leaders who conspired against Christ and had him arrested and tried. Others hold to the element of the zealots, who are a relatively small group of Jewish guerrilla fighters who rebelled against the Roman occupation of Judea. The constant menacing of the zealots led to the First Jewish-Roman War, also called the Great Revolt, which began in 66 AD, just a few years before the end of the temple. A short time prior to the siege of Jerusalem, Josephus describes certain terrifying prodigies that occurred in the temple. Some of these signs and prodigies Josephus wrote of were the following. There was a strange sword-shaped star which appeared over the city, and a comet which lasted for a year. A bright light appeared around the altar in the sanctuary late one night in the month of Nisan, so bright that it appeared to be daytime. A heifer about to be sacrificed gave birth to a lamb in the temple court itself. The great eastern gate of the inner court opened by itself at midnight, and the temple guard had great difficulty closing it again. Then, in the month of Jar, an incredible phenomenon appeared. Before sunset, chariots were seen in the air, and armed soldiers were seen, hurtling through the clouds, encompassing the cities. After a siege which reduced the people to starvation, both Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed. Josephus writes, The troops were now setting fire to the gates, and the silver melting all around quickly admitted the flames to the woodwork. The Jews, seeing the fire encircling them, were deprived of all energy of body and mind. In shock, none attempted to ward off or extinguish the flames. At this moment, one of the soldiers snatched a brand from the burning timber and flung the fiery missile through a low golden door, which gave access to the chambers surrounding the sanctuary. As the flames shot up, a cry as poignant as the tragedy arose from the Jews who flocked to the rescue, now that the object of all their past vigilance was vanishing. On all sides was carnage and flight. Most of the slain were civilians, each butchered where he was caught. Around the altar a pile of corpses was accumulating, and down the steps of the sanctuary flowed a stream of blood. The number of Jews killed during the siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD surpassed 1.1 million approximately, and in the surrounding areas over 250,000 roughly, in all over 1.3 million. The treasures of the temple were taken as spoils to Rome, where they were carried in a triumphal procession. In addition to the vessels of gold that were plundered, a copy of the Jewish law was taken, along with the purple hangings from the temple. Many of the Jews that survived the destruction fled to areas around the Mediterranean and elsewhere. This would echo the exile of the Jews after the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Babylonians over 600 years previously. To this day, the destruction of both the first and second temples are mourned by Jews annually on the 9th of Av, also known as Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is regarded as the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. The Book of Lamentations, which mourns the destruction of Jerusalem, is read in the synagogue, followed by the recitation of liturgical dirges that lament the loss of the temples and Jerusalem. This is the Leap of Faith.